Um, it's uh, great to see you uh, here in person and on uh, on screen and various screens uh, to uh, join us to celebrate uh, the wonderful Brent Salter's uh, lovely book, uh, which we have a copy of here. Go get your own. Uh, Negotiating Copyright in the American Theater, 1856-1951. And uh, I just wanted to uh, just say a few words of thanks before we uh, get started. So uh, thanks to Stanford's uh, TAPS, Department of Theater and Performance Studies, and Matt Smith, chair, uh, sitting sitting right there. <laughs> we appreciate your support. Um, thanks to uh, Hal Round for uh, hosting the live stream, and in particular, uh, VJ Matthew and uh, Thea Rogers. Uh, thanks to the um, ASL uh, interpretation being provided by um, Pro Bono uh, ASL, uh, Kevin De La Rosa, Susan Pacheco, and Ashley Rodriguez. And thank you to um, the National Captioning Institute, and in particular, uh, Jesse Yadul. And forgive me if I am mispronouncing anybody. Um, OK, so let me just say a quick word about format. Um, so I'm going to say just a, a little bit of uh, introduction here, followed by um, uh, Kathy uh, Bowery, uh, who's going to say more about Brent's uh, scholarship. And then we will have uh, comments by um, Derek Miller, uh, Kara Swanson, Marla Schweitzer, Anne Folino, and Jose Beido. Uh, and then Brent will respond for a few minutes and we'll open up to uh, questions. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing everyone. Um, Kathy, Kathy Bowery is a professor in the School of Law, Society, and Criminology at the University of New South Wales. She is a co-director of the International Society for the History and Theory of Intellectual Property, and has, among other things, two recent books, uh, Copyright, Creativity, Big Media, and Cultural Value, that just came out in 2021, and then uh, co-authored with fellow panelist um, Jose Beido, uh, Adventures in Childhood, Intellectual Property, Imagination, and the Business of Play, um, coming out with um, Cambridge uh, Press soon. Uh, Derek Miller is the John, J, John L. Loeb Associate Professor of the Humanities and Associate Director of Undergraduate Studies at Harvard, where he's based in the English department. He is the author of, among other things, Copyright and the Value of Performance, 1770 to 1911, and again, uh, a whole bunch of other articles on theater history from a legal and economic perspective. And with Brent, uh, he co-organized the first US conference on theater and copyright at Yale uh, in 2018. Kara Swanson is a professor of law and affiliate professor of history at Northeastern University in Boston. Uh, her prize-winning scholarship considers historical intersections among law, science, medicine, and technology with particular attention to race, gender, sexuality, and questions of property and intellectual property. Her first book um, is Banking on the Body, the Market in Blood, Milk, and Sperm in Modern America. And she has a new book in progress uh, entitled Inventing Citizens, uh, Race, Gender, and Patents. Marlis Schweitzer is, professor, um, is a professor in the Department of Theater and Performance at York University in Toronto. She's the author of a bunch of books, uh, including uh, When Broadway Was the Runway, Theater, Fashion, and American Culture. Also, Transatlantic Broadway, The Infrastructural Politics of Global Performance. And uh, also, uh, Blood Tyrants and Little Pickles, I love that name, uh, Stage Roles of Anglo-American Girls in the 19th Century, which um, won the George Freely, Friedley Memorial Award from the Theater Library Association and she's a former editor of Theater Survey. Anne Felina White is uh, Associate Professor of Theater Studies in the Department of Theater at Michigan State, where she was named the Michigan Distinguished Professor of the Year by the Michigan Association of State Universities. Um, she is editor of Theater Annual, a journal of theater and performance of the Americas. And she's published um, a whole bunch of articles and her book, uh, Plowed Under, Food Policy, Protest, and Performance in New Deal America received the CLR James Book Award from the Working Class Studies Association. 
Uh, Jose Beido is a reader in law at the University of Kent in the United Kingdom. He is the Spanish national editor of primary sources on copyright 1450 to 1900, an online archive curated by Lionel Bentley and Martin Kretschmer. Uh, and his recent book projects are Landmark Cases in Intellectual Property and also Adventures in Childhood, Intellectual Property, Imagination, and the Business of Play, which we just heard about because it is co-authored with Kathy Bowery. So I will um, leave it to Kathy to um, comment more on uh, Brent's many uh, talents as a scholar. I just um, wanted to take this opportunity, uh, this moment of celebrating all things Brent, um, to uh, say a few brief words about um, how much Brent has mattered to law and history here at Stanford. And here I speak on behalf of all of us who uh, love and care about law and history uh, at Stanford. Uh, Brent has been absolutely instrumental in um, everything we've done as a center uh, in the years he's been here. Uh, I could take up the whole day to day just talking about everything he's done, so I can't, but I'll you know mention a few. Um, he drove our successful first time application for uh, seed grant funding for a new digital legal history project. Um, he and here I could just hear their endless details in this one alone. He is the reason we survived and thrived uh, during the hell that has been the pandemic. Um, and he's constantly brainstorming, um, you know, new things, uh, including, you know, how do we involve students uh, in our programming, which have all been wonderful. So I'll shut up because I want to leave time to talk about the book, but um, you know, from all of us really, uh, life without Brent is very difficult to imagine without your incredible creativity and your diligence and your passion and your just all around kindness and wonderfulness. So um, here is a little something, don't have to open it now, but I want it to be memorialized from all of us here. Kind of a big little something. <laughs> and with that, please, Kathy, take it away. <laughs> Hi, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, look, I'm really, really pleased to have the opportunity to participate in today's event and this very worthy celebration of Brent's new book. And I'm going to just give some, I guess, some Australian background to Brent's scholarship and very briefly talk about what the shadow of this Australian heritage brings to US theatre studies. So I first heard about Brent when he was studying his undergraduate law degree uh, in the early 2000s, but he already had a degree in performance studies at that point. And his law lecturers kept ringing me up saying, you've really got to meet this guy. He's really interested in theatre. He's fantastic in terms of history. He's involved in our digital humanities project here, where there's a lot of digitisation of early legal resources. Um, you know, he's really interested in pursuing critical approaches to legal subject matter. And in the type of work that he does, he takes as little for granted as possible and really thinks deeply about uh, the questions that need to be asked about that particular kind of social problem or issue. Brent went on and received the university medal and we spent a lot of time talking about PhD options and he was always torn between studying in law or theatre studies, but in either school, if you like, or either, either discipline, he was, you know, obviously only particularly interested in pursuing historical approaches to the subject matter. Brent's first significant work on theatre was published by a specialist Australian theatre press in 2009. Um, and that itself is a really mark of honour. I think it's probably the most, the first legal, legal scholarship that that um, uh, enterprise had ever really published. Um, and it's a really important press in Australia. In discussing it with him, I was really, really impressed by the way he was very deeply engaged with theatre professionals as his uh, informants, but he wasn't actually seeing them as informants where he was simply pillaging what theatre professionals had to say and using that to, in a sense, pepper his uh, legal analysis with insights, but actually was really taking it seriously and really thinking about and trying to understand the questions that theatre professionals had to ask about the world and then thinking about law's role in that. Um, of course, that led him to actually also understand that the way that a lot of intellectual property scholarship talks about authorship is very, very far removed from those kinds of concerns in a practical way. And I think the other thing that came from being an Australian theatre um, theater scholar was that, that he really understood that here, one of the ongoing problems is how you survive as a theatre professional. 
there's a lot of dark nights, there's very limited public funding, and there's very narrow scholarship um, or sponsorship opportunities. And I think this is one thing that really impressed on Brent studying American theatre. How are economic opportunities being created? What kind of creative efforts are being supported? Uh, and in what proportions? And where do these opportunities actually travel to? Um, and then thinking about then what the role of law is in all that, unpacking that. The second kind of Australianness I think that Brent still carries with him is his scepticism of rights analysis. Whilst the US and Australia are both settler colonial jurisdictions, in Australia due to its Anglo common law sensibilities, there's this unspoken recognition that there's a very unfinished under-designed and deficient nature of positive law. And in theatre, this translates into looking at social and professional networks, looking at industry relations, organisations, private ordering to judge the relative degrees of agency and also how those types of relations are made visible or not made visible in law and what counts with what qualifications. So in other words, with Brett's scholarship, law is always thought of something which is coming into being. Um, and the law that really counts is um, that that affects access to our culture, which is authored primarily by industry practices that interact with the much more rarefied presentations of law. And I think history really matters here, of course, because it really exposes those connections as they're made and remade. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more with all these fantastic commentators that we've got assembled here today. And I think it's a huge mark of respect to Brent that he has such a high caliber um, and really interesting group of people who are interested in talking about his work. Um, and I'm very much interested to hear what everybody here has to say about his approach to theatre history and what his book has found. So thank you, Kathy. Um, I think Derek, you're up. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon from where I'm sitting. Can I be heard here? Mm -hmm. All right, great. Um, so my thanks to Brent for this occasion to celebrate him and this work, to Amelia and Kathy and the HowlRound staff and at Stanford and everywhere else involved in supporting this. Um, and to my fellow panelists, I, like Kathy, am really excited to hear these varied responses to this work. We are here wonderfully to celebrate Brent. And uh, I think I, I wanna take time to acknowledge that you will not find a more generous, rigorous, knowledgeable, energetic, or warmer scholar uh, than Brent Salter. And it's been a real honor and pleasure being able to work around alongside and with him in various ways um, throughout uh, more years than I can count at this point because the pandemic has made me unable to count time. Um, we are here too, though, not just to celebrate Brent, but to celebrate this book that he's written, which has of course been mediated by many other personages um, and which we are in the process of mediating together today in our interpretations of it. Um, this book is a major contribution to our thinking about copyright in the wild, we might say, about the development of the American theater, about authorship and creativity, and about mediation and contracts. Um, so in my 10 minutes here, of which I've already probably used one, I am going to first summarize the book, something that I've volunteered to do because I knew the book would be so thorough and convincing that I was afraid I'd have nothing to add. And so I figured if I, if I took the summary that I would be covered for my 10 minutes at least. Um, and uh, then I have a few thoughts to offer some uh, areas for further research in the form of essentially rhetorical questions. Um, and any graduate students listening, please, these would make magnificent dissertations, at least those areas Brent isn't already halfway through writing up himself. So this book, again, is Negotiating Copyright in the American Theater, 1856 to 1951 by Brent Salter, published by Cambridge University Press in 2021 in the Cambridge Intellectual Property Information Law series, and it has a lovely cover. Um, it is a book about mediators, about play publishers, about brokers, about pirates, about producers, dramatists and their associations, especially the Dramatist Guild. And along the way, of course, we see a fair number of lawyers. Plays, as Brent notices from the get-go, require a huge amount of mediation to go from a script to a production. And that mediation is transformative. These are not just middlemen. These are mediators who are changing the form. And many of those mediators engage in copyright and the various contracts in complex ways, either through license or outright sale, or simply by setting the terms and norms on which any given 
uh, value, economic, or control over elements in the script to production pipeline can be managed. Uh, the other thing that I think this book is about, which, which Brent himself doesn't foreground as strongly rhetorically in the introduction, is but this book does so brilliantly throughout, is this is also a book about contracts. If this book were even more Latourian than it, than it uh, sets out to be, and there's, there's some discussion of Latour in some of the footnotes, including drawing on Marlise's work, um, uh, there's a version of this story that notes how important contracts are to copyright as well as legislation and, and litigation. The book knows this, it's telling us that story alongside that of the human and institutional mediators we see along the way. So how on earth does Salter manage to do all this? Well, through an almost unfathomable amount of archival research, which leads him to case studies of key institutions and individuals, and then in the part two, an in-depth look at the Dramatist Guild in the first part of the 20th century, uh, particularly leading up to the minimum basic agreement of 1926, uh, the, which set a floor for playwrights contracts with a certain class of producer, and then the battles with producers over the nature of the guild and its membership and its members claims uh, in the decades that followed. The first chapter is about play publisher Samuel French based in London and his son Thomas Henry French based in New York. The Frenches are exemplary mediators for the early part of this story because they ran a transatlantic business that emphasized taking plays from particularly the French market in translation, perhaps through the United Kingdom to the United States and the US market. They ran both a print-based market selling certain kinds of plays, but even more importantly, a massive market in unpublished plays. And one of the many things this chapter works through, this is a very underdetermined summary of this book. Um, one of the many things this chapter works through is the way that French is using common law copyright claims in state courts to protect their foreign origin works and prevent the performances of unpublished works, all of which have very ambiguous status in American law in the period. The second chapter then looks at the play pirate Alexander Byers. He was a Chicago-based entrepreneur who helped to facilitate unauthorized performances around the US. And like any good historian and writer, the word alleged appears a lot in this chapter because it's really hard to make up what was really going on with Byers, um, though Brent has done his level best to pull the archive forward and think through the implications of, in particular, the really muddy red, uh, record of how Byers is using copyright registrations and various other kinds of claims in complex, contradictory, often kind of incoherent ways to assert control in places where allegedly, likely, he actually had none. And yet Byers was key to a lot of the operation of the American theater in uh, of the latter decades of the 19th century. And Brent is thinking through how he's intersecting with copyright and using both working with and against copyright to distribute plays through the country. The next chapter then takes up play brokers, um, talking particularly about Elizabeth Marbury and Alex Kauser. Um, they offer themselves as intermediaries, but particularly between playwrights and producers. They help to promote work. You can pay them to read work. They make connections too among playwrights, directors, producers, and stars. And they set norms of compensation, particularly with the emerging area of film rights. And then we get a last chapter in part one about play producers focused particularly on the theatrical syndicate, the monopolistic cartel that ran theatrical production in the United States in the latter part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, and then the Schuberts, uh, the brothers who uh, fought the syndicate for monopolistic control of the American theater and more or less won and remain in control through uh, a few years after the mid 1950s, uh, when Brent's book stops. Um, the Syndicate and Schubert's uh, chapter is focused on the diffusion of contractual control uh, on the one hand, the way that so many different entities are controlling different pieces of a given theatrical property, the way that film rights come and require different types of intervention, the way that so many works are based on novels, and that's yet another license that may belong to another individual, um, and the way all these different parties come and go in and out of their relationship to a work. And then we also get some wonderful discussion of the tensions between between the authors and the producers artistic authority, which is going to become the key to part two. Um, part two kicks off with a discussion of the Dramatist Guild. The Dramatist Guild was the 
well, we'll just use the word guild because this is part of the story here. What exactly is the Dramatist Guild? Um, they were a, an association, a trade association, a term that, that Salter uses often, um, that uh, leads eventually to a, a what is called the minimum basic agreement. It's a, a this sort of standard baseline contract that most playwrights are using for a certain class of producer on Broadway. And the producers are committing to use these contracts as the bare minimum. Uh, some of the issues that immediately come up in the establishment of the minimum basic agreement are whether or not first, the guild is an open shop. That is to say, anyone can come and go. And they're, they're saying, look, we're not really closing off the American theater versus a closed shop that only people involved with them can work uh, under these agreements or can work with these producers. And then secondly, the resistance from the Schubert's, which becomes the key to the guild uh, story over the next three decades. The latter two chapters, the last two chapters then focus on uh, Ring v. Spina, a key a case in which the legality of the Dramatist Guild comes into question. Um, part of the first chapter on Ring v. Spina goes into more detail about how the Schubert's were working with and around some of the minimum basic agreement by looking at the late hit of the 1930s, Hell's a Poppin, and the way the Schubert's both gave over authority to the purported creators of the show, as well as constrained it in their resistance to using certain types of compensation or contract with those same writers. Uh, and then we get the story of Ring B. Spina told in remarkable detail. I learned so much from all of this book, but here in particular was a story that I was just thrilled to get um, all of these pieces. Um, Ring was an amateur producer um, who got into a big fight with his authors over the ability to insist on script changes. Um, and then also the question of whether or not the guild had to arbitrate uh, the disagreement between the writer and the producers. This led then to lawsuits that ended up raising fundamental questions about whether the guild itself was an illegal trust. And Issues are raised in this dispute about whether or not the Guild is an open or closed shop, about whether playwrights are selling goods, their plays, or their services, about whether there existed realistic alternatives to the Guild that you could actually work outside them, in which case maybe they weren't as monopolistic as it seems, and about whether playwrights really were actually employees and thus perhaps unionizable or independent contractors. In the end, all these questions remained unresolved in a complex way that Salter lays out in wonderful detail but they linger over the story of the remaining uh, uh, 60, 70 years after Ring v. Spina. Um, the epilogue then talks about a lot of issues, shifting forms of author payment, lingering threat of antitrust suits, wider revenue sharing, including with investors and amid rising costs, nonprofit community and high school licensing, the consolidation of the publishing industry, Disney's Broadway production model that threatens to be more like film, and the implications of streaming theater. I haven't given you a half of what's going on in this remarkable book. But that is a general overview of the shape of the story, this essential story about the development of the American theater that Brent's book tells. Um, I see I have 30 seconds according to my timer. I'm gonna allow myself one quick minute here because I did everyone else the favor of summarizing <laughs> um, this incredibly rich study. So uh, I have some questions. The question's not about what Brett has done, but about what we should do now that we know this story. Um, as the summary suggests, this is a magnificent book. It's tremendous in research and range. It's a wide and deep view of American theater during a key century of its development. The epilogue brings some of these stories into the present. One story I wanted to hear more about was about play brokers and how their function gets divided among agents, literary managers, even in some ways, MFA programs. How do we think about these mediators and their norm setting? Is their mediation essentially different? Are they playing the same roles? Have some of these roles disappeared? Second, there's an amazing view here of the commercial market in the US, particularly Broadway and touring routes. Uh, there's some view of other theater markets, especially as they connect to New York. There's discussion of the Federal Theater Project and Little Theaters, for instance. Now, how do we think about copyright outside of the financially massive, but in some ways culturally less significant uh, commercial setting of Broadway? Um, Elementary and high schools, there's some discussion of that briefly in the epilogue. Summer stock, community theaters, theater in colleges or theater schools. Um, the volume of plays written for these markets is quite large, even if their commercial value might seem relatively minor. I'd love to hear about how this story fits into the contraction of the theater industry in the US. 1926, when the minimum basic agreement is signed is near the peak of theatrical production in New York. It's a decade after the drop in touring activity. So to think a little bit about the balance of power between producers and playwrights in the context 
context of the expansion or contraction of the theater market, as well as the general US economy. And then lastly, there's some wonderful pieces here about genre, about the way that the Schubert's are thinking about reviews and how's a poppin. And I think one of the challenges and implications of this story, and Brent works so hard to get us there, is to really decenter playwrights from our story about mediation, control, and creativity in the American theater. He doesn't get to the playwrights until part two, really. Um, they're around the story, but it's about everyone else first. Um, can we imagine a retelling of this story in a way that thoroughly decenters playwrights and recognizing their the marginality of the writer to so many of the genres that were essential to the American theatrical ecosystem in the 19, late 19th and early 20th century. These are invitations that I think are coming directly from this remarkable text. It's a great honor and pleasure to celebrate this and to begin mediating uh, this book's journey through our intellectual system. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, Kara Swanson, please. Uh, hello, all. I also want to add my thanks and um, especially congratulations to um, Brent. It is a wonderful accomplishment to write a book. It is a wonderful accomplished book to finish a book during a pandemic. It is also just a wonderful thing to celebrate somebody's um, first book with them. So um, congratulations. And I'm so pleased to be a part of this. Um, as you might have gotten from my introduction, I have no experience in the history of theater or um, copyright. So when I read the book, I read it from the perspective of um, business history and perhaps less obviously, although I hope to make the connection from the history of uh, technology. And then I also have some thoughts about it um, as someone who once upon a time practiced copyright law and still um, teaches it. So starting with business history, I just wanna say, what I especially like and cherish about this book is that it is a careful archivally based business history of this 100 years of US theater. And I just wanna underscore that because I worry a little bit that the title negotiating copyright might cause some readers who should read the book who are interested in business history that need to understand business history in this period um, might miss it. Because what it offers to them people that aren't necessarily thinking about theater or copyright is the rarity and the pleasure of having a legally trained historian and Kathy explained in you know, Brett's um, multiple levels of training, um, doing a deep dive into contracts and showing us the daily way in which paper and profits flow among writers, producers, theater owners, and others. In Brent's hands here, copyright is only the starting point for processes that involve multiple mediators, as Derek just explained, who shift over time um, and are constantly using contracts to define their relationships. And then also what this history teaches is that his contracts are much less stable than lawyers might assume and that, that historians might assume. These uniform contracts that eventually come up, the minimum basic agreement, exist always alongside private arrangements and all kinds of heterogeneity. And Brent also shows us how contracts with uh, regarding one particular show can change during the show's run. So here we have a history of theater that is undistracted by the dazzle of what happens on the stage or even the drama of the courtroom where that patent attorney, and I loved it when the patent attorney showed up, that patent attorney ring is trying desperately to recoup um, his losses. Brent keeps our attention on those paper flows passing from hand to hand and always in each transfer, both in the written agreements and in the practices that he so artfully shows evolve in this network of repeat players are constantly rebalancing what Brent calls the triumvirate of authorship, ownership, and control, right? That's what we're always thinking about. And he also never lets us forget that even the contracts that he's following, that nothing on paper really has ultimate authority over what appears on the stage. The script, as Derek just said, doesn't have ultimate authority, but the contracts don't either. Who's performing it in which cities, with which lines, what music, always under negotiation, always um, mediated through practices as well as formal agreements. 
And as business historians, I'm sure that people will think about this history in comparison to that of other copyright intensive businesses. I'm thinking about the map makers, Rand McNally that Catherine Fisk has investigated or uh, other stage-based businesses like dance. And I'm thinking of Anthea Kraut's work. But I also wanna step outside um, um, the that maybe obvious comparisons to think about businesses like the railroad. Because in the same decades that Brent's talking about, the second half of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, American railroad companies were competing for physical spaces, the routes between cities. And that's one of the things I really like about Brent's book is he constantly reminds us that the physical spaces, the theaters, the routes for tours, where you store the unpublished manuscripts matter, even though we're talking about this ephemeral thing, a performance and intellectual property and immaterial form of property, but that physical space and property do matter. So the railroad companies are also competing for physical spaces. They're experimenting with vertical and horizontal integration. They're also trying to control the movement of goods, not from writer to stage, but from farm to table not in a 21st century artisanal slow food sense at all, but in a very mechanized, industrialized, efficiency maximized sense. And railroads, historians have showed us, did this with considerable government intervention, including access to free or cheap land, adjustments to tort law, regulatory agencies. And Brent's history begins, 1856, with a government intervention, the revision to US copyright law that added public performance rights to dramatic works. But after that start off, the history that Brent tells us is really devoid of government intervention. I just want to underscore that, right? We don't see government subsidies or regulatory structures. And we also, um, in this story, find that copyright law itself is curiously absent. Brent's periodization, and periodization, of course, is important to how historians tell their stories, is not by revisions to the Copyright Act, although he does tell us of revisions in 1870 and 1897 and 1909, each of which at least formally gave playwriters more control. His periodization is instead, in part one, as we just saw, by mediators, which groups of successful businessmen were shaping the theater business to suit themselves for a series of decades. And then part two, by the guild, by its agreements and brings inconclusive litigation. And then there's also food for thought here for historians of technology. Because as I read the book, um, Brent really helped me think about a play as in so many ways like a technological innovation which multiple historians have showed us usually involves numerous inventors making contributions and then a massive network of lawyers and financiers and business people that uh, work together to make it a feature of our daily lives. And I'm thinking of here of classic 19th century inventions like the light bulb, right? Useless without electric substations, power lines, light fixtures, and the telephone is another example. And for those sorts of inventions, um, both human nature and intellectual property law prioritize the selection of one creator, um, Alexander Graham Bell on the telephone, for example, um, who is assigned to an innovation that really require multitudes. And Brent's showing us that plays are no different. There is a playwright, but plays also have this tension. So I celebrate Brent's investigation into the performance of a dramatic work with care and attention to its social construction and a network of actors and how that construction he shows us includes law and legal actors. Um, but gives them much less pride of place than a history of copyright law might um, give them. And that brings me to um, copyright and how Brent's book has made me think about how copyright law is taught and talked about. In some ways, his history supports traditional framing of copyright law, right? Copyright law makes the author paramount. You have to identify one that entity is assumed and supported by the law. Public performance rights, dramatization rights are consequential. But in other ways, um, Brent really provides an alternative phrasing of copyright law. Copyright law is often taught, including by me, as a history of copying technologies, a form of combined technology in business history. And while Brent discusses the complicated history of both unpublished manuscripts and public published scripts and talks about the power of owning printing plates by French and Son in the 19th century and the significance of the new technology of film, 
What's striking to me in this history is that these technological changes were not the crucial flux points of Brent's story. Again, he periodizes by business form and intermediaries, not by technology of copying or dissemination. So um, I would add to that decentering of copyright that Derek just talked about, a decentering of technology of copying in this history. And the other thing that I noticed that was missing in this history and not missing in like, oh, oh my goodness, where is it should be there is what I was not seeing was the great copyright cases that we use to teach US copyright law, including Nichols versus Universal Pictures about the non literal copying of a play and community for creative nonviolence versus read about independent contractors versus employees. They're absent from Brett's book. I know Brett knows about them. They're, they're in the footnotes, but they're not what he's talking about. The case he uses as a fulcrum, the ring case, um, is all about uh, base, the difference between independent contractors and employees. So I went and looked at CCNV. Do they talk about this in this? That's the 30 years later where the Supreme Court addresses that very question. And they don't even cite to the ring um, case. So what Brent taught me with that is that there's a legal history of um, negotiating copyright in the theater that is quite distinct from the traditional development of copyright law as we usually teach it. And again, underscores the minimal role of copyright in what is a copyright dependent um, industry. If my students wanna work in the entertainment industry, Brent's teaching me, they need to know a lot more about copy contract law than copyright law. And they better also learn antitrust law and labor law. And just quickly to conclude my few questions, what I'd like to know about more about in Brent's future work is, first of all, that post-1976 world that um, the epilogue addresses. And what struck me about that epilogue was that it stressed continuity much more than change. The same clashes, the same negotiations between parties happening, even with this, um, what we usually think of as a very large shift in copyright law. So that I thought was very interesting in terms of understanding copyright today. Are there really so few changes in practices that are a result of that law? And then I also um, want to um, ask about the role of race and gender in this um, history. It was so striking to me that women show up as powerful play brokers at the turn of the 20th century in that one chapter, and then are really never heard of again in the story that's all about different um, men in different roles. And uh, race, of course, is simply absent from the book when we all know, and I know Brent knows this, that it was not absent from the spaces and power structures being discussed. So what was the role of racial identities and the shifting law of race in America in this story? And I look forward to um, future work by Brent and others on these questions. Thank you so much. Um, so next we have Barlis, and forgive me, I don't know if you say Schweitzer or Schweitzer, so you could tell us, forgive me. <laughs> oh, sure, it's, uh, it's Marlies Schweitzer. Okay, sorry, thank you. Thanks. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you again to all the organizers of this wonderful event today. And I'm so thrilled to be here celebrating the publication of Brent's book. Congratulations, Brent. Uh, you've written a wonderful, as I'm sure you're hearing, a deeply researched book filled with rich insights on the complicated dynamics that shape the modern US theater industry from the mid 19th to the mid 20th century. And while the book's primary focus, at least according to its title, is you know, dramatic copyright, as befits its publication in the Cambridge Intellectual Property and Information Law series, it brings into sharp focus the often hidden or underappreciated individuals, institutions, associations, and related entities that made Broadway, Broadway, that influenced the wider formation of the American dramatic canon and informed competing ideas about the artistic labor of playwriting. Digging deeply into trade journals, business records, case law, theater archives, and more, the book skillfully explains how competing stakeholders influenced which plays were or were not produced in the United States, and subsequently which artists entered or found a place in the canon. Now, I come to this book as a theater and performance historian with a particular interest in the intricacies of theater management and the technological innovations that supported the formation of transnational networks at the turn of the 20th century. And so what excites me 
particularly about negotiating copyright in the American theater, uh, what I view as one of its greatest achievements is its focus on these cultural intermediaries or mediating stakeholder, stakeholders. And I know, um, you know Bourdieu doesn't necessarily appear very much in this text, but you can also sort of think through some of um, Bourdieu's writing on cultural intermediaries. Um, and these are the agents and the lawyers, the publishers, the accountants, the bureaucrats, the office clerks, and the others who worked tirelessly behind the scenes to bring words on a page onto the theatrical stage. And too often in our theater histories, the contributions of these individuals go unseen or unacknowledged. And this is perhaps not surprising. Part of the job of a mediator is to remain hidden from view. It's part of the job. Then the historical spotlight shines brightly on actors and actresses, playwrights, directors, impresarios, the flashy individuals who live in the public eye and cultivate celebrity. Their artistic achievements were and are understood as achievements in large part because the public is trained to admire skilled acting or a well-written play and artfully directed scene. So it's no wonder that so much of the history of the American theater has focused on these prominent figures and their contributions. But what Brent spoke so brilliantly documents is that there would be no American theater without these same agents, lawyers, publishers, accountants, bureaucrats, clerks, and other mediators. Um, and he writes, quote, I call these stakeholders mediators as they do not only facilitate the process of production from page to the stage, but transform the work into the material performance. The ability to transform the original script is how mediators assert economic and artistic influence over theater creation. So a script is merely a blueprint for performance. So that's end, end, end quote there. A uh, script is just a blueprint for performance. It needs to find its way into the hands of a producer, a director, an actor, or a designer before it can be realized and presented to an audience. And mediators make this happen. And Brent's book shows us just how they did it. And as I'm sure we're hearing and, and, and Derek's summary, I think uh, really brought to the fore, it is no small task to cover a century of negotiations, backroom conversations and legal battles. And Brent's approach is appropriately varied and exhibits incredible facility in not only gathering, but analyzing and synthesizing primary sources. Some chapters zero in on specific litigation cases, Stovepipe Hat or Hells of Poppin. Others track changes in formal agreements between managing bodies in the Dramatic Guild or follow the multi-stage journey of a single play like The Lonesome Pine from author's pen to motion picture. Or in one of my favorite chapters, offers a jaw-dropping view of the extensive acts of piracy committed by one Alexander Byers. And so I think in the, 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 the range of methodologies, there's something for theater historians to really gra grasp a hold of. And it's, this book is so rich in detail and diverse in its methods, it's really impossible for me to do justice to the twists and turns in a few minutes. So what I would like to do is just highlight a few observations that I found surprising, or illuminating. And um, perhaps they are not new to others, but for me, I was like, oh, this is really exciting. There is so much drama here. So one, I found it fascinating that what gave the play publisher Samuel French and Sons such a competitive advantage over their rivals in the mid, late, mid to late 19th century was not just the vast repository of plays, but their possession of the physical plates used to print these plays and their access to storage space. Um, and Brent writes, quote, with business interests in London and New York, French had an advantage over publishers because he had the physical space to store theatrical material across the Atlantic, a monopoly over the plates to print plays and the capability to administer the material in multiple jurisdictions, end quote. And so this strategy strikes me as not too dissimilar from that used by companies like Amazon today, control the material, control the storage space, the fulfillment centers, control circulation, and control the market. And it seems like Samuel French and Sons made themselves indispensable and were everywhere. Continuing with Samuel French, uh, I found it striking that the idiosyncrasies of international copyright law in the 19th century actively discouraged publishers from printing the plays that they had secured the rights to. So by keeping a play as an unpublished manuscript, 
publishers like French maintained control of copyright. And once the play was published, existed, existed as a material object that others could purchase, it became vulnerable and was much more difficult for publishers to control their interests. Um, so I think this of course explains why they needed so much storage space because they needed to maintain these, these plays in, in an unpublished form. Um, just as a side note, I also think the whole thing, uh, conversation about memory doctrine, the fact that from much of the 19th century, um, an individual could attend a performance, go home, write down everything they had uh, heard from memory, go back to the performance the next evening, come back and repeat this process multiple times and uh, produce a script and then produce a performance. And they could do all of this without breaching copyright. Um, I know uh, Jarek, you've also written about memory doctrine. I just think it's fascinating. And uh, I'm thinking scholars who study like memory studies. Uh, I think there are many inter interdisciplinary connections that that particular little tidbit alone might um, prompt. Um, also, this is something that, uh, that Derek has mentioned uh, and others have mentioned too, uh, the chapter on brokering theater. I was struck by the discussion of the cultural influence wielded by play brokers like um, Alice Kauser and Elizabeth Marbury, two powerful women who still in, in my view haven't received their complete historical due. Um, and I would really and again echo um, echo Derek and, and Cara in, in wanting to see more about these figures and this aspect of the industry. As Brent writes, quote, the, as the broker is a central character determining taste, their influence goes beyond the economic to the aesthetic, the ability to reshape the work of the dramatist to shepherd it through the production process, end quote. So Marbury and Kauser established dominance within the industry, not just by cultivating good relationships with playwrights and managers, which was of course integral to their success, but also by recognizing how to best meet the financial and artistic needs of actors, managers, and playwrights. So Kauser, for example, cultivated close connections with managers who turned to her for advice on which of the many plays in her brokerage would make good vehicles for star performers. And so her artistic, her artistic interests and taste influenced what made it onto the stage, as well, of course, as her business acumen. And she used her awareness of managerial needs to nudge writers to revise their plays accordingly. So thinking about her position or, or these brokers and their role in the history of Broadway theater and the American theater more widely, I think is really exciting, um, their role as mediators. And finally, just to highlight a wonderful detail and, and to sort of, again, underscore the facility with which um, Brent moves between sources. Um, I love this little detail, the comparison of the original sketch of Austin Strong um, with, the, with the one that appears in Playwright George. Um, it's a sketch of Austin, made by Austin Strong of um, George Middleton, and it appears um, in multiple sources. And in the original sketch, created in 1927, during tense negotiations between the Schuberts and the Dramatist Guild, Strong depicts playwright George Middleton as a St. George figure fighting the Schubert dragon. And in the version that then later appears in Middleton's autobiography, the word Schubert has been blot blotted out. So it's just St. George fighting the dragon. And because of course this, this offers evidence of Middleton's own position and his inability to, or hesitation to anger the Schuberts. Um, and as Brent concludes, the images reveal two understandings of authority that had become hallmarks of the ongoing negotiations in the American theater by the mid 20th century, end quote. And so this is a sense of like looking to imagery to identify these incredible uh, complex tensions, I think is really illuminating. And again, offers um, excellent example for historians of how to work with primary, source, primary sources. Um, so I could go on and on to identify other moments of insight like this. I think this book is really a, a treasure trove for theater historians and, and the methodologies it presents, I think are really innovative and important. Um, a few quick things, I've also questions. I just wanna echo uh, what Kara was saying in terms of gender and race. Uh, I'd love to see more about how that has influenced uh, this, this whole history um, for further, further research. I'm curious about conversations around the death of the author, sort of more theoretical conversations and how or whether that informed um, any of the, the histories, particularly the later 20th century. Um, and um, I'm also really curious about what other kinds of under-examined materials might further complicate this wonderful series of dramas in this period. So, 
that's all I have to say for now, but there's so much more. Congratulations, Brent, on a really fantastic volume. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have Anne Folino. You would think I'd be quicker on the unmute button after two years of this, but alas. Um, I uh, will risk repetition um, because I agree with everyone that this is an absolute wonderful addition to the historiography of theater, business, and, and for my concerns, uh, labor and labor practices. Um, uh, so I'm gonna give some kudos for some global aspects of the book. Um, huzzah for laying out the significant power exercised by quote unquote non-creative um, or the ancillary players in the theater industry. Uh, their work is oft considered mundane and thus hugely underexamined. Um, but you have revealed so much to us by just taking a measured look um, at their investments um, and their cleverness. Uh, I also want to celebrate, celebrate Brent's extensive archival work. It is like a medley of business records and briefs and cataloging of manuscripts. That catalog of manuscripts is um, really just so illustrative in such a compact way um, that it it's absolutely impressive, um, and as well as media and so forth and so on. And, and through this um, really um, fascinating, um, astute pairing of primary sources, he creates a rich portrait of what he calls these mediating businesses and practices and shows us how they shape plays and performance as well as playwrights artistic control and compensation, despite these formal uh, copyright protections that we assume that playwrights possess, um, particularly, you know, when when in our our uh, theater history, we you know we can hear uh, Beckett saying any uh, dispensing with my stage directions is a violation of my play, right? It's so famous and so strong, and to see these mediating forces really shifts perspective um, on on the power playwrights are assumed to possess. I also want to congratulate Brent on his style. I mean, that is some crisp prose. It, and there's engaging footnotes, right? That take the conversation in all these new directions. And I love a good footnote. Um, there's pirates. Uh, and the organization of his narrative itself gives readers a really clear view into the legacies of compromises and rulings and laws that occurred throughout the 20th century, which rendered the Dramatist Guild's legal standing very ambiguous and its bargaining um, on behalf of playwrights weak at best. Um, and finally, in terms of these sort of global aspects of the work, I am most impressed by how measured your account is of those enterprising individuals um, who cultivated artists, particularly playwrights dependency on, cis, on the very systems that they created. And uh, they are clever buggers indeed, but you also uh, uh, historicize them with some empathy and with some understanding um, of the system in, in which they, they are um, a part um, and participating in. Uh, so as you can tell, I find this book invigorating. Um, but I want to highlight just a few things uh, based on my particular interests. Um, first, your discussion of the Federal Theater Project um, and its bureaucracy and relief priorities and how it ultimately left uh, it to the playwrights like John uh, Brownwell to secure the royalties due to them. For me, this calls out for future research, not just on those individual playwrights. I know you're working on John Brownwell, and I'm excited uh, to see that work come out. But for, for how these mediating institutions, here I'm thinking the Newspaper Guild and the Dramatist Guild and the Federal Theater Living Newspaper Unit itself are assigning authorship, particularly in the Living Newspaper Unit because the only person that comes out an author of the living newspapers is Arthur Aaron, who it's 
by Arthur Arendt and the writers of the Living Newspaper Unit. Um, everyone else is left unnamed. And so I'm really, really curious about the assignation of, of, of authorship there uh, given to the director of that unit. So thing two, early in the book, right? This is literally page one, footnote one. I love a footnote. Um, the larger implications of Brent's study are, are becoming apparent to me. Um, so at this point, he's discussing scholars' occupation with intellectual property rights that playwrights have been assumed to control. He's going to disabuse us of those assumptions, um, as well as the, the desire that non-writer creative collaborators, this is the term that Frank uses, such as actors and desires, right, are, are trying to grab on to uh, what they assume is the power that's available to them through copyright. So Brent's book clearly advances debates on this subject by focusing on the ways that copyright law has accommodated and been used or ignored um, to limit the risk and maximize profit of those gatekeepers, facilitators, mediators of performance, such as play brokers, publishers, theater owners, and producers, to the direct diminishment of playwrights' artistic control and economic benefit. In the first instance, Brent suggest exciting future lines of inquiry into the life cycle of a single play in production, right? I have this dream vision now where we have this author in the script and we go to casting director and union representatives and, and we see the life of, let's pick something other than cats, right? From, from the idea through those, through those high schools and elementary school productions, please elementary school productions of cats. Um, but this, the understanding of those transformational forces and the proliferation of mediating forces across um, individuals across the 20th century is astounding, um, all the way through to the Disneyfication of Broadway in which it is, uh, you know, Mattel, that's probably wrong, but it, doll makers are involved in, a, in, in, this, uh, in this process um, of production. So I have a dream, life cycle of performance, get that done. Um, along, along these lines, I, I'm also thinking about the intersection of Brent's research with my own even more directly. And I'm still chewing on the underlying assumption that text-based contributions, right? The, um, the writer creative collaborators, those who make text-based contributions to a play are recognized as more relevant and more lasting, at least in terms of claims to intellectual property rights. I question the implication regarding non-writer and specifically actors' contributions as more ephemeral. Given the plentiful anecdotal evidence of actors improvising lines in workshop rehearsals that appear then in subsequent scripts available for licensing, or actors making performative choices, such as a gesture, an intonation, a bit of physical humor, that are then distilled into writing of stage directions and character descriptions, for which a playwright enjoys copyright, as limited as that privilege might be. I also think about whether to characterize the securing of a subsidiary right for actors by their union, Actors' Equity, in the late 1950s, whether it should be characterized as a success. This was a, a right uh, negotiated in response to the transformation of off-Broadway from an experimental non-commercial playgrounding, and, and you of course cite Chorus Line eventually, um, at, in the second half of your work. So the transformation of it from an experimental playground into one of Broadway's primary proving grounds. And that negotiation, of course, was with the producers associations, not with the playwrights, and provides only for actors to receive comp compensation if they are not given a bona fide offer to appear in the commercial production. So, Equity, the Actors Union called it, quote, an important recognition of the artistic contributions made by actors to the development of the dramatic work, end quote. Despite this comp compensatory measure or 
if it's a success. By the 1970s, Actors' Equity is pushed playwrights to sign off rights in the play to the actors who were appearing in these work workshop productions, so much so had the nature of playwriting if, uh, shifted. Um, they're not now, as equity is, is trying to get playwrights to sign off, and they do, they're not dealing with the producers. They're going directly to the playwrights here. And it reminded me so much of uh, the reconfiguration of royalty to recoup producers and investors expenses prior to play, paying the playwrights. So equity goes after the playwright in the interest of the actors, because as all these, the, those economically insecure are scrambling um, because it can't gain further traction with the producers. This results in that 1981 lawsuit in, uh, involving Michael Weller and David Mamet and four other playwrights, which results in a settlement that's favorable to the writers. The changing practices of playwriting um, from 1950, but following copyright in, in the change of law in 76, alongside those organizational changes and business practices from hiring actors to perform already written roles or star vehicles, which has different contractual terms, obviously, than the rank and file, to hiring actors for developmental workshops raises questions for me about when and whether actors are interpretive or generative authors. As Brent states so frankly, aesthetic compromise serves as a condition of entry into the industry. Whether the intentions of these mediating businesses or institutions were collaborative or exploitative or opportunist, those with control over the resources, including uh, the unions that represent um, all, of the all of the various creative uh, collaborators and their associations, those that control those access to the resources, materials, and knowledge um, of theatrical production, as Brent has beautifully argued, also exercise incredible artistic control. So, life cycle of a play, and please write the second half of this history. Thank you so much. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Jose Bello, please. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Brent. Congratulations. It's, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic achievement. <clears throat> I would like to start by my comments with the questions I had when I began uh, reading the book. Uh, uh, and the questions were, what does this book offer to, um, from a legal perspective? Uh, what are the images of law that emerge from the American theatrical experience? And what is the effect of the book on intellectual property scholarship? Different or distinct from a history of ideas approach, uh, Salter's book shows how the economic and the legal arc were coupled through property and contract, how the political and the legal systems were also tied through bureaucratic and associative routines, and how negotiation and the ongoing struggles to constitute narratives about the past have always been at stake. <clears throat> in a sense, the task of a legal history is to trace the ways in which narratives we take for granted are also constructed and strategically deployed. Drawing on, as everybody has already highlighted, uh, on extensive archival research, uh, the book offers many original insights and therefore it's, it's uh, outstanding. Um, one need only to skim through the book um, and show how painstaking the work was. I was also particularly struck by some footnotes. <laughs> and I had one footnote that uh, it was footnote 108 on page 127 that I was uh, really fascinated by. Uh, the footnote, that footnote for me reflects academic scholarship at its best. Thorough, interesting, and open to question. Did people read contracts as meticulously as Salter does? What is the relationship between Salter and the archive? Even if I intended, the irony is that the book reads like a play divided in different parts. It is a theoretical performance of different elements with conflict, climax, and the drama of litigation. Salter seems to acknowledge this point when he says that the Schubert's could not have written the script any better themselves. 
The book is designed to tackle the problem of finding new ways of thinking about copyright. As a historical account more interested in practice and the reality of copyright on the ground or in the theater, rather than in legal treatises, the theatrical contract eventually emerged as the main protagonist, the central actor in legal communication, and is a battleground. For instance, the basic contract was the outcome of full committees drafting for several weeks, word by word, close by close. And with this insistence on theatrical contracts being negotiated, archived, litigated, and standardized, one could arrive at the conclusion that the theatrical contract became a device for legal creation that in turn enabled the creation of a fiduciary structure or an industry uh, to flourish. To understand the centrality of negotiation, <clears throat> another type of social institution takes the center stage on Salter's book and is the organization. This is remarkable because some historians have indeed defined characters such as Owen Davis as the epitome of the organization man. Certainly the desire for an organization, the impetus for association and the formation of a community or a guild depended on the specific narrative being conveyed and stimulated in the negotiations. Negotiations are defined in dynamic terms as fluid processes and as spaces where a certain exchange of positions could take place. If one pays attention to these missions or businesses more than historical trajectories, I read the book as an anthropological account in which contracts and organizations are not only important for what they said, but also for what they did, their historicity. That is the ways in which they were triggered and promoted and the rituals through which they were discussed, controlled, archived, negotiated, operationalized, and strategically situated. Law, and more specifically copyright law, appears in Salter's book as moving or oscillating between two different poles, as being and as an operation. The distinctive aspect of this way of conceiving law lies in its capacity to grasp this elusive character between the two conditions that are both complementary and necessary. For many, if not most legal scholars, a law is just a right you claim. It is a matter of understanding things correctly. <laughs> and it is often seen as entirely separate from its historical context. But Salter shows its movable character, its elusive character, as the book leads us through different gateways and through a constant refocusing. What makes copyright law worth studying, worth to be studied is not only what has been done in its name, but also what has happened within it. Uh, <clears throat> the, book, the book quickly steps away from the bullet point legislative history and moves to a more nuanced story of how theatrical copyright in North America was discussed and uh, negotiated. With uh, the idea of expectation, uh, copyright reflects, according to Salter, the aspirational normative project about what a rights framework ought to be. In this scenario, law emerged as, an, as a device in a specific horizon that has both a functional and a fictional dimension, a space of desire that, Solter, that takes Salter's book into a bureaucratic territory of mundane practices that brought scripts into performances, transforming works into productions. I had also a quote, but I think Marlies had already <laughs> mentioned the quote. So it's the script is like the blueprint. I was also fascinated by that type of paragraph. It really caught me. Uh, so uh, now the specific questions that the book prompted me. Uh, one of the interesting factors that the book is, uh, or, or but one of the interesting features of the book is how it investigates the workings of copyright across the theatrical production change. It emphasizes the role of mediation that has been highlighted by almost all of you as a key historical component in making theatrical work. And this theme runs throughout the whole book. I was struck by how uh, the semantic spectrum of mediation in his book, mediating stakeholders, mediating interests, mediating businesses, mediating actors, mediating brokers, mediating structures, mediating expertise and mediating art are all present in different instances in the book. 
perhaps the most interesting connecting element to mediation is a product of power, a trust, or as Salter mentions, mediating power. In other words, the influence to circulate, connect, interpret, and negotiate. Can we imagine North American theatrical production without the power of I think some of you have already <laughs> answered that question as well. No, obviously the answer is we cannot imagine uh, uh, the North American theatrical production without these mediators, this, uh, uh, without these power structures embedded in its administration. There are interesting references to infrastructures, but my question refers to the impact not of mediators themselves, but of the specific media technologies that characterize the 20th century and that are mentioned incidentally in the book. And there are three, typewriters, cable, and films. Uh, it is true that there are some reference to the effect of documentation, such as registration, catalogs, and archives, and the illusions that they generate. It is also true that the book looks at films considered as subsidiary rights. <clears throat> what is not so clear to me is how technologies reorganize the way theatrical contracts were conceived and indeed made. In other words, the vital momentum was achieved because of the speed in which contracts we, were made by cable, because manuscripts were typewritten or plays were made because film rights were uh, uh, <coughs> sold. So that was one of my questions that is moving from, from the mediation uh, as a human being to the, to the, the speed and to uh, the technological uh, mediation. In addition to asking whether media has a particular role in this account, I was also interested in the specificity of legal history. The inflation to, of reference to contracts, business negotiation and arrangements <clears throat> led to me the question of the very notion of law itself. Uh, um, is this vision of law particularly dependent on a North American vision? The quest, the ambition to secure a deal, the effect of federal law, the ubiquity of theatrical stakeholders that survive uh, throughout the book uh, <clears throat> uh, appear to me as, as cultural coordinates that reflect a certain entrepreneurial disposition. The celestial backdrop uh, and its historical uh, ramifications are largely part of the North American historical experience that was also marked by this tension between Hollywood and Broadway. To a foreign reader like me, uh, the book discusses um, a theatrical tradition in a particularly rich way. But more interesting to me is that it offers a distinctive mode of thinking about copyright law, which is seen as transactional entrepreneurial, full of assumptions and imagination underlying legal claims. What is the significance of the book for intellectual property scholarship? For me, at least, it offers a distinctive way of getting around law, a move away from the um, a fascination characteristic of legal scholarship on property and a way to handle the complex link between law and history. In that regard, I was less interested in the specific national narratives, but in the connections between, for instance, the Guild and foreign copyright societies such as SASEM, there are references in Salter's book about the way Middleton, Middleton used his knowledge of French copyright. <laughs> but my question is, to what extent these European forays in the early 1920s were crucial to this historical sequence? To what extent some knowledge in the way the French or the British dramatists plied their trade was know-how that served and was transformed in the impetus, for instance, of the American Guild. <clears throat> Although we are reminded that the Guild is a trade association and not a union, I was also interested in questions of membership. I was really fascinated by the whole conversation about close-up <laughs> uh, and, and, and really uh, capture me and make me think, make me think about uh, uh, how membership grew, how it materialized in a list, uh, that was used as a leverage point. While openness was perhaps one of the basic ingredi ingredients for its success, the issue raises questions to me about how news and rumors and gossip circulated and how commitment is also an effect of the coordination of information and, and the, the, the basically PR as, as we would call it today. <laughs> um, so, so 
I have all the, these questions about what exactly, what type of factor was uh, fundamental for uh, the, the formation of the guild? Was it, was it uh, litigation that trigger that the trigger the triggering point was it the arbitration mechanism was it the coincidence with the actors strike was it the guilds efficiency uh, was it the members started seeing it as an investment I guess the answer is the combination of all of these factors but I was interested in in trying to tease them out and and trying to think about the formation of a list and its dissidents, obviously, uh, not only the Schubert's, but, but others. And, and also uh, what were the factors that were, according to Salter, more important for its formation? And just one uh, set question to conclude is, um, I think has also been uh, evoked by some of the commentators, what this tradition entailed today. Uh, Salter's effort to uncover an alternative legal history shows that the current narratives are still bound up in the assumptions, in the mythologies, and in the twilight zones that haunted its protagonists, particularly the rhetoric built around copyright and antitrust. And in a sense, one can see how arguments uh, often give way to either a skepticism or fundamentalism. Uh, what really strikes me about this is how we might escape this trap if we consider the human desire for narrative and to push the specific uh, historical agendas. Uh, so I was interested in what is next in, in uh, Salter's uh, research. Is there a subtext in the book that is aimed at affecting the way in which we consider the relationship between law and theater? Thank you. Thank you. So we were clearly too ambitious. We wanted to hear from all these brilliant people, and we did, and you gave us a huge amount to think about. Uh, but I fear we, we are kind of at the end of the time here, unfortunately. So um, I, all I can do at this point is say thank you. To I would all just, of you. yeah, and I would just like to express my deepest gratitude to you all. And one of the things that is so exciting seeing. Um, so much work come out in, in the areas that um, I've cared about for a long time. I know that you've cared about for a long, long time. This discipline is just how so much exciting scholarship is happening in, in these areas, these interdisciplinary areas at the moment and how we're starting to form communities. And I just wanted to particularly thank Derek for his leadership, his extraordinary scholarship in really, really... Um, paving the way for this field going forward and the extraordinary conversations I hope will follow in the years to come and for to all of you for your generosity today. I look forward to continuing these conversations. I wish I could stay on for longer. Yeah, we mess up the time there a bit, but it was incredibly generous and there's so much to think about as far as just my notes that I've taken here. The next projects, yeah, that have come out will hopefully deal with a lot of the issues. Cara, I'm working on big projects on the federal theatre projects at the moment, multiple projects, and a lot of them are on underrepresented groups in the multiple and copyright relationships in those spaces. Um, and, and on thinking about an integrated legal history of labour in the American theatre more carefully. So the central place of authority being going forward over creativity being labour and thinking about the relationships of between all of these industries and their origin stories and access to these uh, extraordinary private archival collections. And here I want to really thank the Dramas Guild of America and other organisations for their generosity and commitment to, to preserving these private collections, which we will learn so much more about our histories, our theatre histories, our legal histories, our labour histories. So that's the next exciting stage of big legal and labor history of the American theater leading on to this. And, um, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's overwhelming and um, I, I'm just extraordinarily grateful for all your generosity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.